All right, we should be live. Hope everyone is doing all right this morning. This episode of DT Live is going to be that are involved in potentially troubleshooting problems that may arise on Linux. So we're not going to cover, you know, a lot of be the live. Oh, excuse me, I guys. Hope everyone is doing all right this morning. I had the stream open and it started playing on me. Let me mute the stream. All right. Well, at least I know my audio is working. All right. So you guys in the chat, I know you can hear me. The level's good. Nothing weird's going on. Yeah, asking, would I ever do videos on Android hacking, such as installing custom ROMs? I don't play with phones. I don't like phones. Um, he also mentioned phones are becoming powerful enough that you could plug a phone to a monitor and use it as a PC. Yeah, but it's still not a PC. Um, it's useful if you like phones and you're one of those guys that just stay on a phone all day and could it potentially double as a PC? Yeah, but if you're not a phone person anyway, uh, that would be a really poor replacement for a proper PC with a proper graphics cards and things like, you know, things I need for an actual workstation. Audio good? All right. Appreciate that, guys. All right. So today, uh, this stream again, I'm just, is, it'll be a whirlwind tour of a bunch of command line utilities. Uh, we're not going to dive deep into e each individual one because it would be a very lengthy stream. And I want to keep this stream, you know, probably around an hour or so today. So we're just going to cover certain utilities that when certain problems arise, this command might help you investigate the situation. I give you one or two examples of how to use the utility and then we'll just move on to the next one. But uh, for those obviously that want to investigate deeper into any of these particular command line utilities, obviously you can do that by reading the man pages, you know, go read the documentation. Of course, you know, many of these tools, well, I don't know. I probably have done some videos on some of these tools. Some of these tools I don't think I've ever really talked about on camera before. Yeah, I've got my, my coffee, my Wendy's coffee this morning. Went and got some Wendy's breakfast. I got like a chicken biscuit uh, from Wendy's. It was, it was okay. It wasn't the greatest chicken biscuit, but their coffee's not bad. Average Joe, RTFM, yep. Now, always RTFM if you want more information on pretty much anything. Do you watch reels or shorts, DT? I'm not sure what reels or shorts. You're talking about YouTube shorts? I don't watch a lot of them. Typically, you know, I, I like on my YouTube homepage, they'll have like a category of recommended shorts for me to watch. I usually click the little X next to that category because I almost never watch shorts. You know, rarely do I want to go to YouTube and watch something and watch a 59 second video on anything, right? Usually if I'm going to watch something, it's to, you know, veg out a little bit, you know, sit in my chair, lean back and watch a 15 minute video or 30 minute video on something, you know, whatever it happens to be. I've never understood the whole point of the YouTube shorts and the TikTok videos. I see people on TikTok all the time. They got the little phone out. They got the video plays for like 15 seconds and I'll just go to the next video, play 20 seconds of that video. And, just, and it's crazy. I don't understand. Obviously there's some dopamine effect. You're right. There's, there's some, something addictive about that. Uh, I guess to certain people, I can't do it. I've just never got into it. Yeah. Shorts are good as cooking videos. Yeah. There are certain topics that don't need to be a long form video. I get that. Unfortunately, those are not usually the topics that I would go to YouTube to watch something about. Usually I go to YouTube for, you know, like educational kind of videos, like the really dumb, stupid videos. If it's a joke video, most of those can be very short form videos. You can do those in under a minute. 
but like the kind of video I'm doing today, this live stream you know, of some command line utilities for troubleshooting some problems on Linux, you can't do a short form video on something like that. Or you could, but nobody would watch it, right? Nobody that's actually wanting that kind of content would want it in that sort of form. Laughing alone. Yeah, talk, yeah, I, I need to investigate TikTok a lot more. Uh, I only recently signed up for an account at TikTok and used it for the very first time as far as watching videos on it. Because on my other channel, I've done some TikTok reaction videos. <laughs> and I, it just amazes me. You know, the, uh, the quality of content on TikTok. Let's just leave it at that. <clears throat> yeah. Excuse me, guys. Had a little bit of a cough uh, here in the last couple of days. So I do a cough a couple of times during the video or during the stream here. What your own version of shorts? I'm a, I'm a Mozilla, I mean, they don't have a video platform, do they? I mean, it would make sense for Mozilla to do something like that. M make more sense for a company like Meta, you know, the company behind Facebook and Instagram. Make more sense for them to do short form video content or even a company like Amazon, since they have so much storage and, you know, they can host videos. They obviously have streaming services. Netflix. Netflix could get into the short form game. They they would kill it too. I mean, they would absolutely crush it. Well, let's get into the topic for today. I'm gonna switch to my desktop here. Let me open up a terminal. And I'm just going to again just go through a bunch of random commands that could be useful in certain situations. I think logically we need to start by talking about two commands. One the man command, obviously. Man is on your system. Uh, on every Unix-like operating system, you have all the commands on your system. So just type man, name of a command, like I just did man ls. And you can see I get the man page for the ls command. And I could read about the ls command, all the flags and options available for ls. The LS man page is not very lengthy, you know, it's a pretty quick read. So man pages, I am saying that because all these commands I talk about today, I'm not going to do a deep dive in any of them. So if you want more in-depth coverage on any of this stuff, do man name of program, right? <laughs> Just That's all you need to do. And that works on any Linux system. Now, the next command, I actually use this command these days. I use this command much more than I use the man command. And that is TLDR. For example, if I wanted the TLDR on the list command, I could do TLDR LS. And this is just a very quick, it's a cheat sheet, essentially. It gives me eight really quick examples of how to use the ls command. Now, unlike man, tldr is not going to be pre-installed on most Linux uh, distributions. So tldr, you will have to install it, but that's usually one of the first things I install on my new Linux installations because tldr is so awesome. <laughs> like this utility is such an amazing program because for certain Commands, like if I wanted to do the man page for find, so the GNU find command, right? Find is an amazing program. It has a lot of flags and options. And if I just scroll with the mouse wheel, let's just scroll through the man page. Now imagine I needed to search this man page for something. And I didn't know really what I was looking for. So, you know, I couldn't just do a quick search for it. I actually had to read the man page. But I'd have to read this man page, right? This novel. This novel, <laughs> this very lengthy novel. I'm still scrolling with the mouse wheel. I'm not even close to the end of this thing yet. Oh my goodness. You know what? I'm just going to keep scrolling with the mouse wheel till I get to the end. Oh, I finally got to the end, right? So that's, that's the man page for a fine. Now, again, if you just wanted some of the most common examples of how to use the find command, TLDR find is a much simpler man page, if you will. So... 
man and TLDR. You're going to use them all the time for investigating certain problems on your system. And usually when you're trying to figure out how to use a particular program, because that's one of the most common I, I would say issues with Linux users is you want to use a particular command, but you don't know how. I don't know how grip really works, or I don't know how SID really works. Well, man page it or TLDR it. Yeah, so that is the very first commands you need to know. Very quickly, I want to run through the next one that uh, as desktop Linux users, and again, I don't work in IT, I'm not a network administrator or anything like that, so we're not going to cover anything really deep into, you know, network administration or anything like that. But system CTL is probably uh, one of the most common commands related to system D to your system D services. So system D, of course, is your init system and your service manager. So let's start with system D status or excuse me, system CTL status. So this is the system CTL command, right? So this gives you an overview. It uses the less command, so hit space, so you can proceed line by line through the list, but you know, all the services and yeah, in this tree form here. So Q to quit out of the less command. So system CTL status. Now, when you're starting and stopping services, for example, when you do a base Arch Linux install and you want to install Network Manager for your Ethernet and Wi-Fi, right? So you install Network Manager, but just because you installed Network Manager, it's not enabled as a service with System D until you enable it. So you would System CTL, and this needs to be as root. So you either need to have sudo in front of this or be logged in as the root user, but System CTL enable, and it would be uh, Network, uh, if I do a tab complete here, what is the network manager service? I thought it was, I thought it was network manager, but that may not be the name of the service. If I just tab complete, I can get all the, oh, I thought I could get the fish shield to give me all the services and it does. So I could actually look through the various services here. You know, it's a lot of services. But let's just say I pick one, just as an example, I'm not actually going to do anything. Reflector. Reflector is one of the uh, services related to Arch Linux and uh, picking your mirrors for Pac-Man and things like that. But if I wanted to enable that service, system CTL, enable. If I wanted to disable a service for some reason, system CTL, disable. If I wanted to restart a service, um, I could restart a service. So it's already running, but I wanted to kill it and restart it. A useful command, typically when you enable something, you also want to uh, start it right away. So, uh, you know, you have the start command. So you, you could system enable a service and then system start the service to go ahead and get it running. Or you could do a system CTL enable uh, the service and give it the uh, it dash dash now. I believe that is the flag. And that would enable the service with system D, so it always automatically starts. And it would go ahead and start it right now as well. So system CTL enable dash dash now. And just to verify that, I could do a TLDR on system CTL. And it gives me well, a lot of the examples I just gave you with system CTL. System CTL, you could also give it these uh, options here. Is active, is enabled, is failed, name of unit. For example, if I wanted a system CTL, let's check is active, name of unit. Uh, I know SSHD is a unit. Let me do SSHD tab complete SSHD.service and tab complete again. Is it active? No. Right now I have uh, SSH inactive on this system. So that's just a little bit with system CTL as far as stopping and starting the services, restarting the services, enabling the services, disabling the services. You, you won't play with that all the time. Typically, you'll do this when you do a fresh install <laughs> of distributions. If you do a fresh install of something like Arch Linux or minimal distribution like Gen 2 or you know, Nix OS, things like that, you, you may have to go ahead and enable and start certain services for these programs that you're installing. One last thing I'll briefly mention, even though it's not really troubleshooting Linux, but system CTL also does control things like reboot. You can do a system CTL reboot to reboot your machine. 
And reboot is kind of troubleshooting because many times a simple reboot will fix problems on Linux. I, I know we joke about it, but for example, when you install Linux uh, drivers, graphics drivers, or a new Linux kernel, a lot of times you need to do a reboot for those things to actually take effect. So system CTL reboot, system CTL shutdown shuts down your computer. Most Linux systems, though, have this alias. Instead of having to type the full command, systemctl reboot, on most systems, simply typing reboot, reboots, and simply typing shutdown, shuts down the computer. So that was what we wanted to start with, man, TLDR, and then systemctl for your systemd services. Get back to the chat here. And again, I got a bunch of other commands to... I hope try to briefly mention and get through. But I thought those were some of the most important, especially for desktop Linux users. Like you really need to know those commands. Uh, Aston says, hey, DT, watching. Uh, what about info? Yeah, you have the info command. That's uh, GNU's info. Uh, not everything's going to have an info page. Everything should have a man page, though. But there is info if you want to. And if you're an Emacs user, and instead of using you know, your standard uh, terminal emulate, emulators, you were using Emacs, maybe you're using a terminal emulator inside Emacs. Emacs has both the man command. It also has the woman command, which is a better man page, you know, woman instead of man. Uh, you can also install the TLDR program inside Emacs, there's a, like an Emacs Lisp version of T TLDR. <laughs> yeah, um, K.E. Anderson, I use OpenRC. Well, obviously those were for systemd distros, obviously on uh, non-systemd distros, starting and stopping your services, you know, are gonna be different commands. But I, I, the command played with OpenRC are, are not that, they're not that different as far as the structure of, you know, some of those system CTL commands. It's pretty self-explanatory. Stopping, starting services. Also run it. Run it's real easy. Uh, but, you know, like 95% of the people watching this stream are going to be on a system D distro. So that's what we're focusing on for the services. Oh, we got somebody uh, giving us a hello from Gone World here today. All right. Since so we've got a lot of commands to cover, let me get back into the terminal and clear the screen. And we talked about system CTL. We should also talk about journal CTL. If I do journal CTL, no other flags and options. Once again, we, it enters us into this uh, essentially a log. Uh, with the less command, that's why we got this uh, bottom part here says lines 1 through 28, but just hit enter and you go line by line through the log here, yada, 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 Q to kill that, right? To, Q quits out of anything when you find yourself in a, a less command, you know, just Q to get out of it. So journal CTL essentially gives you a log and sometimes you'll find errors in there. If you want to search for the errors, you could do dash B. Uh, thankfully, the fish shell reminds me what it is because I, I would have had to think about that for a minute. It's journal CTL dash B and then dash dash priority equals three. I believe that searches specifically for the error messages. So it will give me, yeah, see a lot of these lines include an error. Um, journal CTL, uh, another useful flag is dash U if you want to search for a specific unit, for example, like the SSHD uh, service that we were playing with, with the uh, system CTL status, SSHD.service, you know, to check the status. We could also check uh, any log information, any journal information here for this unit, SSHD.service. There's no entry for it, so there was nothing in there about SSHD. That's, again, just a very brief overview of journal CTL. I bet it has a TLDR, so let's go ahead and check it. Yeah. And really not, not a complicated command. You know, not much to it. 
And it's a command I rarely ever use, a journal CTO. It's rare that I, I go to that thing looking for any kind of error messages. But sometimes if your computer, especially if your computer is having serious problems and you have no idea what the problem is, you know, going into the logs and, you know, looking for certain error messages, sometimes you'll, you'll find things that you didn't expect to find in there. The next command is another one I don't use. I believe it's one of the standard GNU core utils, the PS command, which is the process command. Uh, typically, the way you'd use this is PS and give it these options, AUX, PS space AUX. Couldn't tell you what any of those flags mean, but I just know that's typically how you get your processes. <laughs> it just spits out a list of all the processes, who the owner of the process is, the process ID, and of course, the name of the process. Now, what you could do if you get the name of a process and, you know, for example, you have a program that's frozen or it's, you know, it's something bad has happened to a certain process that's running on the system and you can't, for whatever reason, shut it down the proper way. For example, a graphical application, the close button didn't work, you know, the, the program's frozen. You could go with PSAUX here, right, and find the process ID and then you could kill, you know, that particular program by its process ID the kill command. Now, I, I don't, again, I don't use PSAUX all that often. It's useful. The process command is useful in scripting. That's why I mentioned it. If you were creating like a D menu script or a row free script that displayed all of your processes and then you could pick one to kill it through a D menu script or a row free script, like you could do that, right? But there's already a really useful tool available on most Linux systems called HTOP. HTOP essentially gives you all that process information we just looked at, you know, and you could actually, you know, sort by CPU percentage or memory percentage. Or you could do a search by a name. You can see F3 here has the function keys down here. F3 would allow me to search for a specific process. And then when I find that specific process, I could hit enter on it. And it's going to ask me, you know, do I want to send it a uh, sig term command, which would kill the command, right? So HTOP. That's actually usually what I do when I need to find a process and kill it. I just always go to HTOP because it's an interactive tool where PS is not an interactive tool. It just spits out that list of processes and their IDs. And again, PS, very useful in scripting. You can't script with HTOP because it's an interactive program, but if you want an interactive program, HTOP obviously is the way to go. While we're talking about killing commands, obviously you had the kill command. I could kill PI, uh, the process ID of a command if I find the process ID. A lot of times I don't know the process ID, but I know the name of the program as far as the name of the binary that is the problem. For example, if I know that all instances of the alacrity terminal right now are frozen, instead of kill, I could do a kill all alacrity, and it just killed all instances of alacrity, <laughs> any process that was an alacrity process, it just killed it, right? Now I got to open the terminal, zoom back in. So kill all, name of program, will kill all instances of, you know, like a kill all Firefox would kill all the instances of your Firefox browser if, you know, the browser was frozen for whatever reason. Another one I love to use uh, if I don't know the name of that process ID or the name of the program, but I can see the window on the screen, open a terminal or a run launcher and type xkill. xkill turns your cursor into an X. Right? You can see the cursor has become an X. Any window I click on, the next window I click on with the mouse will be killed. So if I click on Alacrity, it's gone. And once again, <laughs> open Alacrity and <laughs> zoom back in. So that was PS for your processes, HTOP, which is an interactive process viewer. HTOP is probably what you're going to spend most of your time in uh, it, when you're looking for processes, like an out-of-control process, or, or you're just curious what process on your computer is taking up the most CPU right now or the most RAM right now. And then kill, X kill, kill all. You need to know those.
All right. I'll get a super chat there. <laughs> Uh, the name, I wish I could pronounce your name, but I, that H, H-Z-Q-K-I. I don't know if that's a real name or not. <laughs> Just some random letters. Uh, but I appreciate the super chat. Is it possible to separate all system processes into one box and user run in another? Well, sure. With something like PS, um, you could actually use a command like uh, awk or... I don't know how much time I want to spend on this, but let's do PSAUX. So the first column is the owner, right? And you see some are owned by root and some are owned by my home user, the DT user. If I wanted to, I mean, you could pipe those into, you know, certain commands like the grip command. I mean, if I just wanted to grip for the string DT, um, yeah, it gives me all the lines that contain the string DT. Now, there may be some false positives in there because I really should have specified that the line starts with DT. And if I zoom back out so you can see, you know, I get a, a pretty good list to work there, right? And of course, I could have gripped for root if I was looking for all the processes owned by root instead of DT. So yeah, yeah I mean, we've covered a lot of the the magic of you know the shell utilities as far as piping and using tools like grip set alk i did a video just a couple of weeks ago on grip set alk <laughs> the magic behind those three commands especially for things like you're asking so go check out that video and i've done individual videos on grip set and alk as well as far as a deeper dive into each and every one of those because once you know grip, set, and awk, and then through the magic of piping, yeah, you, you can go pull out any information from that PS command that you want. Yeah, what happened to my message? Empty soup, leave me a message, I guess. I don't know, maybe it didn't like something you said? Uh, Google YouTube. Uh, <laughs> It's kind of crazy with the messages. And I know that, and there's nothing I can do about it. I get messages that just are deleted all the time. I know you guys, I, there is a substantial percentage of you guys leaving comments on my videos that for whatever reason never show up. And they're not bad comments. There, there's nothing as far as, there's no profanity in them. There's nothing controversial about these comments you guys are leaving. And then they just disappear. And I know it's frustrating. It's frustrating for me because it's not just your comments. It's my comments too. And I'm not talking about my comments on other people's videos on their channels. If I leave a comment under some of my videos, my own comment on my video on my channel sometimes gets deleted by YouTube. Think about how crazy that is. So I know it's frustrating. There is absolutely nothing me or any other creators on YouTube have over that. And what's funny is, you know, they delete all these comments unnecessarily. But then at the same time, the bot problem on YouTube is so out of control. So they can't get rid of any of the bots, but then perfectly legitimate people that are trying to post on YouTube, they delete all their comments. And, you know, I don't want to be, I get it's a problem. Like, it's a big problem to solve. Like, I don't want to sound like, you know, YouTube is. Purposely deleting all that. Like, I, like, I understand they're trying, you know, and, but they're losing, you know, and, and they're a trillion dollar company. You think a company with as much money as Google could actually do better at this than they are. But I, again, I understand it's a huge problem. I certainly have no clue how to solve it myself. <laughs> like, like if uh, somebody high up at Google, you know, contacted me, hey, how do we solve this bot problem? You know, all these, uh, you know, half the comments on some of my videos are nothing but bots. How how do we get rid of all the bots? Hell if I know. <laughs> like, I, I'm just going to be serious. I wouldn't even know where to start. How do you verify that people are real or fake? And it's becoming more and more of a problem on social media, not just YouTube. It's the whole internet.
Uh, have you tried Piewall before? Yeah, for setting wall hour or whatever. Yeah, Piewall, the program uh, used to be very popular many, many years ago, like 10, 15 years ago. Uh, used to hear a lot about Piewall. You don't, don't hear about it much anymore. I don't know if it's still under active development. I'm, I'm sure it still works. But yeah, I have used it. It's a fine program. Yeah, no wonder software engineers are leaving, you know, these large tech companies, especially those involved uh, in the AI race. I mean, you know, the, the really skilled developers are going to be in very high demand. But there's going to be a lot of competition for the smart developers. I don't know if Google is going to be the one that attracts uh, most of those. Obviously, companies like I have, obviously with AI, NVIDIA is sucking up a lot of those developers. So is Microsoft. Um, Meta is also big in the, the AI game. I know Google wants to be, but you know, it's trying to get into it now, but they're kind of late to the game as well. getting some spam email <laughs> alerts on my phone just for all right let's see now I mentioned I'm not into IT or network administration on your machine for example you open up a web page and it doesn't load uh, is the internet down or is it just a problem with that site well you could open up a terminal and use the ping command Ping, uh, let's ping Google. I'm gonna ping Google every second or so. Control C to kill the ping. But obviously, internet is working here because it's pinging Google just fine. If the internet was not working, you'd get nothing returned here. And of course, any website, it's not Google, but Google, you expect Google's always gonna be up. <laughs> like, Google's never gonna be down. Well, that's one just to check to see if your internet's working at all. But of course, if you had certain websites of your own, you know, you could ping your own website to see, hey, my, my website up. For example, how about distro.2? Let's ping it. I haven't visited my website in a long time. I hope the ping works. It does. <laughs> all right. Took a second, but yeah. All right. I haven't done anything with that website in so long. Uh, some other interesting networking commands. You could do ifconfig. That's going to give you your IP uh, address information. So ifconfig. If you also just want to get your IP address and nothing else, you could do IP space A for IP address. I think you could do it uh, in the long form if you wanted IP space address. But just IP space A would give you your current IP. I'm not going to uh, display my IP here on camera. Because some of you guys, I just don't trust you. So, <laughs> so ping, um, ifconfig, IP space A. Some other interesting network stuff while we're talking about it. Again, I, some of this is more for those of you that are more professionals as far as in a network administration. But you could do host-tns for name servers. You wanted to know the name servers or of some domain you know I get the name servers for google.com for example with the host command other uh, if you wanted some other DNS uh, information I believe the dig command for example dig uh, google.com would give me yeah some information here about Google commands I use hardly ever matter of fact if all the, those five or six commands I just showed you Occasionally, I will use ping just to see if my internet's working. Other than that, maybe twice a year, I'll need to know my IP address for something, and I'll type IP space A. <laughs> right. so those are not commands that are going to be that useful, and they're not something you're going to use all the time, but when you need them, they could be useful. Back to the chat here. Yeah, Sprinkled says, just want to let you know your desktop looks fantastic. Appreciate that. Yeah, the desktop um, 
haven't changed anything in many months, but this is just a Q-Tile, the tiling window manager, and a, the panel at the top is just Q-Tile's built-in bar. Got a little conky here. Conky really serves no purpose other than just being here. The wallpaper, oh, that's really nice wallpaper. I don't know where that wallpaper came from. It's in my uh, wallpaper repository over on my uh, dot files repository on my GitLab. If you go to gitlab.com slash DWT, you'll find a wallpaper repository. It's got like 300 and something wallpapers in there. That wallpaper you saw is going to be one of the ones in that repo. Yeah, and you guys are mentioning a lot more networking tools, uh, NMCLI, the Network Manager CLI tool. Yeah, somebody was asking about uh, route tracing. Uh, there's pl there are uh, plenty of uh, networking commands on, on Linux. There's dozens of them because that is one of the most common things, especially for those that work in uh, systems administration. If you're a system admin, that's really what you're focused on a lot of the times is that that networking stuff. As a matter of fact, that's one of the most common like news articles. Like when I'm just trolling the internet, lo looking for you know uh, Linux related content, news articles, blog posts. One of the most common sites, like on the big tech sites, is always uh, the top ten network administrating tools on Linux, or top fifteen, or top twenty. You know, they give you these list of you know some of these tools. Yeah, NCDU <laughs> for one for disk storage queries. Yeah. You guys got some different, I knew you guys would come up with a lot of different commands, so keep them coming because I'm not going to cover every single thing because, again, I've got a lot of commands to cover here. <laughs> We've already been going for 35 minutes, and I am not halfway through some of the commands I wanted to talk about today. I need to get a, a move on, so let me get back into the terminal. So let's cover. Another kind of networking related one, but not really. It's uh, wget. Wget. What this does is it downloads things from the internet. You give wget a uh, an address. So let's give it https slash slash. Uh, how about google.com? Well, I can type google.com. We keep <laughs> pinging Google. Uh, I'll go ahead and download google.com. Wget google.com. What that just did is it downloaded uh, that address. HTTPS, Google.com, and of course, slash index.html is the main page at Google.com. It just downloaded that page, that front page of Google, as HTML. It's here in my home directory. If I did a ls, uh, there will be an index.html that it just put there. Now, I don't really want that, so let's go ahead and remove that file. But that is wget, right? You give wget the location to something, you know, typically it'd be something you want to download. That's not necessarily the HTML file of a web page. A lot of times it'll be the location to some.iso. For example, if you're downloading an ISO from the command line, you know, and you knew the location, the URL of an ISO or whatever it happened to be, a, a zip file or you know, things you want to download. Now, why would you ever want to go to the terminal and download something with wget rather than just going to your browser, Firefox or Brave or whatever browser you're using, just navigate to the URL with the browser, click on it, and it'll download it in the browser. Why would you go to the terminal to do some of this? Sometimes you don't have access to a GUI. Imagine I didn't have a desktop environment. Xorg was not installed, or Wayland's not installed. All we have is the TTY, but I need to download something on that machine. So imagine it's a server. Well, that is where you would use something like wget, because obviously you can't use a graphical browser <laughs> in the TTY. So trust me. There, there, there's times when you need wget. You think you wouldn't, but I, I, there have been many times where I've been stuck in a TTY for something and I needed to grab a file, you know, wget. Now, you don't necessarily can use terminal-based browsers.
Now this is, so instead of wgo 2 you would need to navigate the web to search for a URL. You could use a terminal-based browser like Lynx, which is usually the one I use. Uh, I, I did a fresh install of my system not too long ago, and I didn't actually install the Lynx browser. But how about Lynx spelled this way? Uh, nope, I don't have either Lynx or the other Lynx installed. Is W3M installed? W3M is installed by default, I guess, here on Arco because I didn't install W3M either, but it's here. So let's view Google.com and the W3M browser. This is the front page of Google. But let's imagine I navigate to a page that instead of just being an HTML page, it's going to be a file that I could download, like a zip file or ISO or whatever, some archive of something, right? Then instead of displaying that web page like it's doing, it's going to ask me, there'll be a little dialogue box saying, hey, you want to download this, yes or no? And you click yes, and it downloads it. And essentially what these terminal-based browsers are doing, they're just doing the wget for you. Right? In the back end, they're just wget, that name of file. But again, if you didn't know the URL, then just opening up a browser and navigating it, navigating to it in the browser makes a lot of sense. Uh, thanks for the super chat uh, from Sebastian there. He says, I love your work. Can you briefly cover DOD CAC smart card support in Linux? I can hand jam everything in a couple of hours. I literally have no idea what any of that means. So I don't think I could briefly cover any of that. What the hell is a DOD CAC smart card? Uh, again, I'm not a pro IT professional. I, I just use Linux on my desktop computer. Like uh, I don't do anything complicated. I browse the web, and like last night, I played a little Sour Broughton, which is a first-person shooter, free and open source first-person shooter, by the way, on Linux. Like, I don't do. I don't, like I got to Google what some of that means. Uh, I wish I wish I could talk about it a little further certs pc sc light uh, firefox chrome but would like to get a script going so the installation on everything is automated i'm trying to help fellow dod contractors that want to move to linux yeah dude i, I again i i don't live in that space so it would be uh irresponsible for me to even <laughs> give you any anything on that Oh, uh, Department of Defense ID cards, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you, you need somebody that's actually a professional. Uh, it, it has nothing to do with uh, any kind of systems, admin, or, you know. If you're new to the channel, by the way, uh, my profession is actually what you see right now. This is uh, talking on YouTube. I'm like express commercial, you know, where a guy's pretending to be a doctor or whatever, pretending to be a surgeon, and, and the nurse asks, her, are, are you a doctor? And he says, no, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night, meaning he, he's a smart guy because he stayed at the right hotel. <laughs> yeah. Let's see, when will you move to Wayland? And, and when it works, when there's uh, window managers available that I want to use, I'm not going to move to Wayland just to use Wayland. Well, I mean, Wayland doesn't matter. Wayland's the display server. Xorg works as far as a display server. You know, obviously, the UI, the user interface, the UX, the user experience is the most important thing on a computer. And if I, uh, I want to be able to use the window managers I want to use, which Qtile does have some experimental Wayland support, and I, I know some people have told me it works okay. Uh, it's still buggy, but some people tell me it works okay on some machines. I can tell you on my home computer with uh, NVIDIA, uh, no. But yeah, I mean, once it works, uh, once, in, once Wayland works properly on some desktop environments or window managers I want to use. I'm not going to use GNOME. You guys know I don't like GNOME. I, did, I, w I wasn't using GNOME on Xorg. I'm not going to use GNOME on Wayland. <laughs> like, well, it's, because it's still GNOME, right? It's the desktop environment still the same. What the hell does it matter whether it's running Xorg or Wayland? The desktop environment is still the same. If I don't like the desktop environment, I don't care about the display server. Hmm. 
Hey DT, what are your thoughts on Hyperland NVIDIA card? I know Hyperland has some NVIDIA support, but I don't like to really try something out like a like a window manager. I'd have to live in it. And I'm not going to do that. Not when I know it's going to be an inferior experience right now. I'll wait till, till it's pretty much everybody says, hey, it, it, everything just works, right? Then I'll switch. I, I, I don't introduce heartache into my life for no reason. I actually do work on these machines, this computer here at my office and the computer at home. You know, obviously this computer is the one I do most of my content on as far as recording, editing. I, I just need things to work. I'm not going to install anything that's experimental or beta quality kind of software. And occasionally I do work on my home computer as well, as far as video editing and things. I don't do that much there, but that's the one with the NVIDIA card. I, you know, I, I already know it would be a nightmare trying to run some of that stuff there. Yeah, it works fine on your uh, 4060. Yeah, I know the newer NVIDIA generations are good. My card is the previous generation. I have the 3060. I know for those that are on the 2060, you know, series, I, I know uh, Wayland is is very, very bad on those, um, which is something to know for those of you that are actually thinking about building a machine or upgrading a card. Uh, if you're wanting to run Wayland, maybe you're, especially if you're wanting to run uh, GNOME or KDE Plasma, which kind of do work pretty well with Wayland these days, but still it would be advisable to get a uh, a newer card, a, a new card. Don't buy something used. Don't buy something ancient. I know so sometimes you want to save some money. You'll find somebody that's practically giving away a 2060, but again, if you've, your goal is to actually be on Wayland, you want a newer card. Yeah, Gen 2 just works. Yeah, I would say that. I don't want adored. Let's talk about getting some information about like the hardware on your computer just very briefly. Um, because sometimes you'll need to know, hey, what's what's the CPU? What's the GPU on a particular machine? If you, for whatever reason, you didn't know. Didn't know. Uh, DM, DMESGD message here. Is that... Did I not spell that right? I did, but I didn't give it a, a any kind of one of these commands. I don't use that often, so and I zoomed way in here. Let me zoom back out so we can actually see. So yeah, so with no other arguments, it should have worked, but there was no. Uh, Nothing to show. Show kernel messages. I guess I needed to give it sudo privileges. That's me not actually reading the error message. And now it actually works. So sudo d message. And you can see it's going to give me all the information about various things that are connected to this machine via uh, PCI or USB. And of course, again, if you needed to search for particular strings, you could use the magic of something like grip, for example. Oh, uh, well, looks like I gripped AMD for some reason a while back in the fish show. <laughs> uh, it gives me information about my AMD uh, CPU and GPU. Or, you know, you could grip, I don't know, USB if you wanted some USB connections. Or piece, uh, PCI. Hmm. Inf uh, useful commands now that d message command is always going to be there this one may not be i n x i so this particular command without any arguments this gives you some system information you see my cpu some speed kernel memory storage the shell that i'm currently in and then of course the version of i n x i there are some flags you can give INXI, I believe, dash F lowercase z. Gives you that same information from before in a longer form, essentially. So this is a very brief overview, but dash capital F lowercase z. This is in a little more detail. You get a little more information. INXI dash R. Yeah, so that's the repos. 
Let's say the chaotic AUR I have added here. Marco Linux repos. So useful commands if you need to know some of what, as far as hardware, is connected. Actually, there's several GNU utils that you could also use for this information. And these are you, uh, commands I don't know if everybody knows exist. Those include lsblk. You've probably seen that's the list block command. This is going to list all your block devices. So all your drives. And it shows the partitions on each. lsblk, list block. But did you know there is a lspci command? List PCI devices. And that spits out everything connected to your computer via PCI. That's, uh, you know, PCI connections on your motherboard, right? Which is my AMD GPU. There's also a LS uh, USB. You want everything connected via USB ports. You can see it lists well, actually quite a bit of stuff here. My Moonlander keyboard that I'm currently typing on, of course, it's a USB device. The Elgato cam link, which is uh, used to capture my camera, is connected via USB. Uh, some other things. I, I, I don't think I've ever used L. You may or may not find that useful at some point. I Again, I don't think I've ever really needed to use that command. There's also the uh, lscpu, list cpu uh, command here. Never really needed that because typically you can get all this information from some of those other commands I've already shown you, like dmessage and inxi, but all useful commands, dmessage, inxi. Then you have a uh, List block, list PCI, list USB, list uh, modules, LS mod, and uh, list CPU. Yeah, uh, Carpet Bug says, yeah, do the list. There are flags and options. There's probably flags and options available for all those commands. I know I didn't give flags or options for any of that that I just showed other than INXI. Um, but again, you're wondering about flags and options. You always have man pages available. So if I did a man page on the LSBLK command, you can see it does have a few flags and options. Actually, quite a few. So, you know, there's a little bit of stuff to LSBLK that probably most people don't know about. If you wanted the quick version, right, get the TLDR on BL, uh, LSBLK. I have actually used this. For example, I, on this machine, I don't think I have any snaps installed or mounted or anything, but if I had a, a machine that had a lot of snaps, like an uh, Ubuntu machine, maybe an Ubuntu web server or something, sometimes I install things as snaps, and I want to do it LSBLK, it'll have all the snaps that are mounted because they're mounted as loopback devices. But I believe if you give it the dash E, and I think it's seven, that would remove the uh, loopback devices. Uh, from the LSBLK command. I could be wrong about the number, but I know it's dash E and some number. I think it's seven. Because I know people uh, don't like seeing all those loopback devices sometimes in the output of the LSBLK command. Well, you can get rid of that. You can filter it out. Now, can you talk about CHMOD? CHMOD scares me terribly uh, hard to work with. I have actually done a video about Linux permissions several years ago. I actually go to the desktop. And because it is a little deeper of a topic, I, I will briefly talk about chmod in just a second, but I have done a video about the permissions on Linux. This video right here. I'm actually going to copy it and paste it in the chat. And I go into detail of ch own and ch mod, change owner and change mode.
But chmod, I essentially, well, a, a particular directory to 755 permissions. If you don't know what 755 permissions are, uh, again, check that video <laughs> that I just posted in the chat. But basically, uh, chmod 755 is pretty permissive. It allows the, uh, the owner to pretty much do anything with the file, and it allows other users to pretty much do everything except write to the file. Uh, I could write execute permissions. So typically, for example, this long form ls command, you see read, write, execute. So permissions on Linux, clear the screen. Read, now read, write, execute, read, write, execute, read, write, execute. You'll, you'll see a string like that. RWX, RWX, RWX. If you see that string, that permission is 777. Why is that 777? It's because these are assigned number values. The R is assigned a value of 4, I believe, yeah. And uh, W is 2 and X is 1. And if you got all three, that flag is a total of 7. That's the owner of the file. And you have the uh, members of the group. And you have pretty much everybody else. 777, obviously, that is a dangerous permission. Anybody can read, write, execute. That file. They knew whatever the hell they want to that file, whether they're you or whether they're root, whether they're just some other user on the screen. Uh, how did I get the color output to the read, write, execute permissions? Um, that is done because my ls command that you see me type is not really ls. It's actually eza. Eza is a, a better version of the ls command as far as more colorful, as a little bit more output, you know. Uh, there's a lot of flags and options with easy a I, I forget all the flags I use with it but, but I give it some long form flags as well but I have that alias to just ls anytime I type ls we could actually go view my bash rc do a search for easy a yeah Th those are my ls uh, aliases right there it's alias to easy a dash al dash dash color equals always dash dash group directories first i like to see the the directories grouped before the actual files this program used to be called exa but exa died and was forked and reborn as eza so. and eza is pretty much repositories it may not be if you're on an old crusty stable distribution where eza the new version of exa hasn't made it into their repos but if you're on arch or arch based distribution or anything kind of modern eza you should find it in the the repo All right, chmod, uh, again, deep topic with chmod and permissions. Go watch that video I posted, but I just gave you a very brief overview of what all of this means. And you can see some of this information in a graphical uh, file manager. Like if I open PCmanfm, which is my graphical file manager here, I go into my uh, videos directory here, and maybe I want to know what the permissions are for this file. I can right-click on it, Properties. Go to permissions, and you can see. View content, change content, execute. View content is read. This is execute, right? So RWX. Those are right there. And you can change those permissions in a graphical way, if you prefer, rather than the, than the command line. Or sometimes you won't have a graphical file manager to do things. And again, sometimes, a lot of times when you need to change uh, permissions or change owner of a file, you're stuck in a TTY, and that's probably why you're needing to do some of that stuff is because some bad things have happened. Maybe you can't even get into your desktop environment or window manager if you're in a TTY. You really need to know how chown and chmod work. Some other useful commands... Uh, I don't use this one very often, free, and then dash H tells me about my memory. I've got a total of 62 gigs, 4.4 .4 gigs is 
free. 6.5 gigs is used. Now, of course, again, HTOP, which was the interactive process viewer, it does give you memory and CPU information. You guys see that on a lot of my like distro installation and first looks. When I look about look up uh, memory and CPU usage, I typically use HTOP. And the reason I use HTOP is I just want to use the same tool for all of those videos just to make things equal on an equal playing field. So I always use HTOP to measure that thing uh, on my videos. See, right now, using about 6 gigs of my, I've got 64 gigs of uh, RAM in this machine. The reason I'm using 6 gigs, obviously, is uh, we're streaming. Using some of that, uh, that memory. Using quite a bit of CPU. I've got a 12-core, 24-thread Threadripper. And we're using some CPU. And the reason it's using some CPU is, again, I'm streaming. Live streaming on the internet takes some CPU. That's why you can't really stream on a potato laptop. Uh, usually the CPU is going to be what holds you back. All right. So we, an hour in, which is useful commands, especially now for Linux desktop users, right? And we're not talking about necessarily network administrators, although... Uh, system admins may find this useful. Whatever package manager that particular distribution uses, sometimes it's useful to list all the programs installed on the machine. On Arch, using Pac-Man, I could do this with dash capital Q lowercase q. So just give it Pac-Man dash capital Q lowercase q, and it spits out everything that is installed on this machine line by line. That's very useful if you need to know if a particular program's installed, maybe because you were troubleshooting an error message and somebody told you, well, you know what, I'm, I'm having a problem on my machine and somebody says, well, that's because this particular library on my machine caused this problem. And you go, oh, I wonder if I have that installed. Well, you can actually search for it, right? For example, if I wanted to search for, maybe somebody says, you know, my problem has to do with Firefox. Well, let me do a Pac-Man-QQ. Is Firefox installed on my machine? Let me check. It is. Okay. Of course, usually you wouldn't you you would know if Firefox was installed on your machine, but usually it'd be some random uh, lib that you'd be searching for. I don't know, libvirt, <laughs> which is a, a library for virtualization used for QEMU. So, and, and of course, that's Pac-Man on servers, the Pac-Man-QQ apt list dash dash installed give it that flag at the end dash dash installed and you get the same listing of all the programs installed via the app package manager line by line and then once again just grip for what you're looking for um, if you were on I don't know Red Hat or CentOS or something like that something that used DNF I believe DNF I don't use DNF that often but I believe it's DNF list installed no dashes, just DNF list installed. You would get the same information. Another thing you could do that's useful on a desktop computer is, for example, uh, Pac-Man-QQ, get a list of everything installed on my system. Maybe I know I'm going to reinstall. I want to reinstall exactly the same set of packages on my new installation as my old installation. Well, I could write this to a file. I could Pac-Man-QQ. And I could save that to whatever I want to save it to, packages.txt. Now let me vim into packages.txt, and there's a list of everything. I could take that file with me to the new installation when I reinstall, and I could just feed that file into Pac-Man and have Pac-Man install everything from that list. Some neat things you can do, you know, via the command line that are not used to using the terminal in the command line. But, but once you find out some of the really neat things that you can do that could save you a ton of time, like you, you'll use the command line all the time. Yeah, on Void Linux, somebody's giving the XBPS uh, query command, dash L for list. Yeah. I'm glad you added that because I wouldn't have known that <laughs> right offhand. I'd had to, you know, I have to look up the uh, the void commands uh, with XBPS anytime I I need to use them.
Same thing with uh, Gentoo and Emerge. Uh, I, although I've used Gentoo a little bit more than I've used Void. Still, you know, some of the lesser used commands. Uh, I've got to Google them. All right, let's go ahead and just very briefly mention it's not a command line, it's a GUI application, but you guys using desktop Linux, Pavu control, P-A-V-U control, pulse audio volume control. If you do anything with audio and video multimedia content like I do as a YouTuber, you're going to open this program all the time. For example, if you guys, when I asked you at the beginning of the streams, my audio working, you guys have said no, I open this and I would see what my input device is set to. Okay. Because it's not picking up this microphone. It's probably picking up the microphone on the camera over here. Or, you know, if I had another microphone, you know, some kind of audio device, it's it's got the wrong input. So I'd come here and make sure that that is set to the right input. Volume control, again, not, not something command line related. But you guys, uh, especially some of you guys, I know some channels or maybe starting channels on Twitch and things like that, doing streaming, and you're going to have nightmares with audio and video. That's just always the case with this sort of thing, and you're going you're gonna to open up Pavu control all the time. All right, guys. Well, I covered, you know, a, a lot of commands, obviously. I tried to get through as many as I could. You guys uh, mentioned some other commands, uh, issues uh, that you could happen on Linux and commands to solve them. So appreciate you guys sharing some input. Yeah, there is NCPA mixer in the uh, command line. Yeah, if you needed a, a terminal version of Pavu control, there is NCPA mixer. And I have used that in the past. Rarely, though, I mean, like a lot of the times, though, when I'm using, uh, when, when I need that kind of information, it's because I'm doing something streaming. I, I'm already in a desktop environment, right? We're already got a display server up and running. So usually I just use the graphical uh, tool. Usually you're not forced to, to go to the terminal for something like that. But it is nice to know it's there in case, in case it's needed. Uh, Greg says, thanks for showing G GPT for all. I've been having a lot of fun with it. I've been really enjoying playing with GT uh, GPT for all. Horrible name, by the way, <laughs> but, but that is a really cool tool. Yeah, I, I'm very glad that I found it. Uh, and I, I didn't find it. Like, I didn't just stumble across it. Some of you guys actually suggested it to me. Uh, some of you guys have been suggesting that tool to me s several months back. Like, people, hey, man. You need to check this out. And I just got around to it because I didn't expect it to be all that interesting. But I got to say, I, I really like playing with uh, some of these chat assistants. Have you ever run into issues with the Zen kernel? So, um, but you asked the question. And I'm sure there's plenty of people in this chat that have used the Zen kernel. And if you guys have run into issues with it, uh, why don't you let him know? The Zen kernel, a lot of people that use the Zen kernel are trying to get a better performance, especially on like gaming Linux distributions. I'm not a hardcore gamer, so uh, I, I just stick with the generic kernel. I've never, never gone with the Zen kernel. All right, guys. Well, uh, let's go in minutes. Let's do a quick Q and A session. So, ask away any questions, comments. They could be related to the topic of today's stream, whether it be command line stuff or just anything, anything in general. Linux for an open source software. I need to finish my cold cup of coffee now. It's been sitting here for a while and it's no longer hot. But I need the caffeine. I'll drink it. Yeah, James says, DT, there's some good AI coming to Linux like this. That's one of the great things about uh, the AI chat assistance is with uh, accessibility programs, uh, it's really going to change 
the game on that, but not just with accessibility. Um, so many things on a computer are more complicated than they need to be. For example, finding system settings. Like you want to change a, a setting, for example, in KDE Plasma. And if you've ever used KDE Plasma and gone to its like control panel, like its settings manager, there's so many settings and you don't know what most of them do. And it's very, the way it's set up is very convoluted and complicated, even for somebody like me. It would be great if I just had a voice assistant. You know, some AI assistant that's already built into KDE Plasma. I just ask, hey, can you change this setting for me? And it just does it. Instead of me having to spend 10, 15 minutes searching for where the hell is that setting? Is it in this? Is it in that? What's it called? You know. Using computers will, will get a lot easier because of AI. Yeah, let's see. Uh, by the way, been playing a competitive video game and Linux generic kernel. Uh, so much development of the Linux kernel these days, really because Steam has been a thing on Linux for a number of years now. Well, it's been like six, seven, eight years now. Steam on Linux. So much work has gone into making the gaming experience on Linux so good. I imagine the generic kernel, just the standard generic kernel, is fine for gaming. I, I don't really think you, you gain much by trying to go to something else. But again, I'm not a hardcore gamer, so take that for what it's worth. Oh, uh, let's see. Have you ever used DDC Util program? I have never used that program. I don't know what it is. So, uh, no. There's so many of these command line utilities, though. I guess one of the things that is hard to know all of them. A lot of, there's a lot of overlap in what a lot of these tools do. So a lot of times you'll find one that does something, and then later you'll come across another tool that does pretty much the exact same thing, but you know, because you already know the other tool, you don't learn about the new tool. Um, somebody's asking about the real-time kernel. I have used the real-time kernel in ye many years ago uh, because of latency issues when I was playing around with uh, the audio server uh, as far as switching from Pulse Audio to Jack. And, you know, Jack, it was better to use the real-time kernel. But I think, again, kind of like when we're talking about the Zen kernel, the, the generic kernel has fixed a lot of its issues as far as audio latency um, to the point I'm not even sure if the real-time kernel makes a difference anymore the way it did in years past because nobody talks about it anymore back in the day a lot of people used the real-time kernel for audio work now you never hear anybody mention it and i think part of the the thing is because the generic kernel is starting to implement a lot of that stuff and it's just made the real-time kernel not necessary Oh, let's see. Hey, on the video demonstrating Kaspersky, Kaspersky virus removal tool, has your stance on it changed since making the video? What stance? I showed you a, a piece of software. Um, that's it. I, I, I didn't have any kind of weird stance as far as political stance. I really didn't even have a stance on the fact that it's a piece of proprietary software. Which I never, yeah, you know, I don't cover a lot of proprietary software on this channel. I know some people want to occasionally see, especially important pieces of proprietary software on Linux. Like, you know, Steam, for example, is propri proprietary. I'll talk about Steam on Linux because it makes sense. You know, Steam has, it's, it's been a good thing that Steam is on Linux. And I do think it would be an important thing on Linux as well as to have some of the proprietary uh, popular virus removal tools, any virus software on Linux, because all that stuff is proprietary for the most part. And a lot of people have been waiting on it. A lot of people were excited about having Kaspersky on Linux. Of course, some people are not. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the fact that uh, country of origin of uh, Russia, even though I think the corporation actually is based in the UK, but still. A lot of people in the free and open source software community, and I know this, I don't suffer from this, but I know some people do. A lot of people really don't trust anything from Russia. A lot of people don't trust anything from China. I have this problem with Linux distributions. Every time I take a look at 
of Rosa Linux, which is a Russian distribution. The comment section is a complete clown show of people. Hey, why would you ever use anything from Russia? Don't you know you, you don't do that, DET, even though it's free and open source software, right? I, I get a lot of backlash because I actually like Deepin. Deepin OS, which is a Chinese-based Linux distribution. I love the Deepin desktop environment. I think it's gorgeous. I think it's one of the best looking Linux distributions, one of the most polished, professional looking Linux distributions. And I think it's the kind of thing we should be showing a lot of potentially new Linux users because I think it would actually convert a lot of people from Windows and Mac to Linux by showing them this gorgeous Deepin desktop environment. It's China, right? Can you trust China, DT? No, you can't. No. I, I don't fall into that. I don't I don't get all political for one thing. You guys know that, you know, on this channel. I typically don't take these kinds of uh, uh, crazy um, stances as far as everything in Russia is bad, everything in China is bad. Nah, I, I just make the videos, um, whatever you guys say in the comments. You guys want to have those kinds of discussions, hey, go for it. Let's see. For some reason, even the Russian government buildings still use Windows instead of Swift. Still, I mean, a lot of it has to do with legacy. There's so many things that it, it would cost so much to switch thousands and thousands of computers from one operating system to a new operating system. You know. And you're, I know some people, well, but the cost of Windows, the licensing for Windows, well, you got to understand, especially for large corporate customers and large government enti entities, Microsoft cuts the, these groups a deal. You know, like they're not, it would cost them more to switch from Windows to Linux in most cases than just to stay on Windows. That's why, why they use Windows. <laughs> the happy channel. He says, Windows will motivate people necessarily that Linux needs to do something better. It's just Windows kind of keeps crapping the bed, right? So. All right, guys. Well, I think let's see what we've got here. About a... Yeah, needs to quite do something. Bit of folks still here. 150 of you guys stuck around to the end of this stream. I wasn't sure how many people would show up for kind of a nerdy stream. This kind of topic, by the way, is usually the kind of topic I would do on a regular shorter video that I would properly edit. Uh, but because I thought, you know, I would cover a lot of information rather quickly. And I don't do a lot of these kinds of live streams when I'm doing more informative tutorial kind of stuff. And I wanted you guys to actually input on some of these commands or maybe commands I didn't even talk about. And you guys were great. So I appreciate you guys hanging out with me today. And other than that, I do need to thank the patrons. So I'm going to show some cards here, some end cards for some of my patrons. These guys, they're awesome. They help support the show. And other than that, peace guys.